Got it. Okay. Mr. Mayor, it's over to you when you're ready. Uh, one moment. Oh. Yep, there you go, Mr. Mayor. Right. Um, welcome to the full council meeting, August 26, 2021. Welcome to elected members, staff, and those who are live streaming. And of course, the international, of course, the international community who are also um, live streaming, streaming. I say that because uh, when Mayor Tim Shadbolt uh, and his council were dealing with the um, microchipping cats, he got uh, online submissions from Czechoslovakia. So to all those people in Czechoslovakia and elsewhere, welcome to the Capri Coast. Um, Council Blessing, Councilor Hanford, would you mind? You there? Councilor Hanford. Kia ora, aroha nui. just had to um, be unmuted by the host. So, ia mātou e whiriwhiriana i ngā take ke mua i o mātou aro aro e pono ana mātou ka kaha tonu ki te whakapau māhara hua pai mō ngā hāpore i mahi nei mātou. Me kaha ki mātou katoa, ki a whaihua, ki a tōtaka tā mātou mahi, a mā te maia, te tiro whakamua me te hihiri kataia, te arahi i roto i te kotahitanga me te aroha. Kia ora, everyone. Kia ora. Well done. Um, um, before I go on, look, um, I ask everybody to have a bit of patience because, um, you know, uh, online technology stuff can happen. Sound can get uh, looped back. There might be disruptions in that sense. So um, be kind and just have a bit of patience and we will get on just fine. Apologies, um, anyone. I can just say that Jackie Elliott will halfway through She's taking a daughter to get um, her vaccinated as an essential worker. So she will just be on photograph for, for a while, but she will be available. And uh, I will be, um, I think, at a public speaking time, um, item 12 round then, I'll have to uh, take leave of this meeting. And uh, Councillor James Coates will pick up the chair from then on. So are there any other, any apologies? No, very good. Um, declarations of interest relating to agenda items. Um, I know that uh, uh, Councillor Holbro, you've got one for item number 12. Am I right? Yes, that's right. Okay, um, we are now going to item number five, public speaking time for items on the agenda. We've got three speakers and then um, Councillor Jocelyn Brav Bravnov is going to read a letter from Graham Trust. Firstly, Tina Pope, you've got six minutes. Um, Richard Mansell, if you're listening to me, you've got three minutes. Uh, Margaret Stevenson Wright, you've got six minutes. So Tina Pope, floor is yours. Hello, am I unmuted? You are now. Yeah. We can Sorry. hear you now. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm speaking to item eight. The Paikakariki Community Board have a fair bit to say on this, but have only a few minutes. So was to focus our statement on how we got to this point. I guess it's a little late to change your minds now, given the time and money already poured into this and the time frame to which you're subject. I'll leave others to express their concerns about the exclusion of community boards from the decision-making process. 
Kaitakari Hui Community Board questions the robustness of the research methodology, the assumptions made by the report writers and counsellors based on the research report, and whether in fact the option you propose and actually addresses the concerns identified in the report. First, I want to acknowledge this is an emotive issue and things are likely to get heated and personal. We accept you have a desire to genuinely understand the community's perspective and to find representation arrangements that are fair and effective given the community's context, behaviours, beliefs and needs. And this will have been a difficult decision to make. However, there are serious flaws in the methodology of the research and the assumptions made by report writers on which you have based your decision. We're not expert researchers, so we asked experienced researchers from within our community to take a look and tell us what they thought of the report. We did not share our own concerns, rather we left them to give us their opinion on the report without further brief. I have only a short time, so I can only raise a few of the issues and statements they made. However, there was great concern about the robustness of the report. I note that a couple of quotes here talk about the publicly stated views of one councillor by name. I've replaced that with one councillor. The first set of comments relate to the methodology of the research on which you've based your decision. Here are some of the statements made by our experienced researchers. The lack of demographic data or clear criteria for who the targeted groups were is a pretty major flaw. It means you can't test their assumptions and underlying logic. I'm concerned that a lot of weight has been placed by councillors on the finding of a report by a market research company, which does not seem to me to be either robust or fit for purpose. Was the research peer reviewed or scrutinised in any way? Doesn't look like quality research to me. If you aren't going to do qualitative data, the quantitative data should be both deep and broad, which it is not. There is no information on how the questioners avoided conscious or unconscious bias in selecting participants, nor any information on where and when street intercepts took place. Statements about random selections do not fit the specific meaning and statistics and survey design of the word where it means that any element of the population has an equal probability of being sampled. People do not randomly select a stall at a market, they self-select. Our reviewers provided many examples of shortcomings in the methodology, but I don't have time to go over all of these. One statement sums up the general response. It is concerning that one councillor has described the consultation as, quote, carefully targeted and the findings presented to council were detailed and, quote, robust and well-rounded. Would be very concerning if the consultation was presented to the local government commission as carefully targeted or robust and well-rounded, unless methodology can provide, be provided to show that this is so. I'll add, from a purely local point of view, to our knowledge, only two Paikakariki residents attended the village consultation. We were also told there were few, if any, research respondents from within our village, due to the research criteria of hearing from those who are not already engaged with council or community boards. We also heard from our reviewers about the assumptions made in the report and by councillors as a result of the report, and that they're not supported by the evidence. Again, a few examples to illustrate the shortcomings. The report states community panels, community boards and council officers were all seen as possible channels for bringing the voice of the community to councillors. Later, it says that the views on community boards, boards come from a small minority of the respondents who were split in their views. So only a part of a small minority had negative views on community boards. And also says some people felt the two layers of elected representatives added unhelpful complexity. There's no information on how many some is, although it's probably less than many or most. Unfortunately, one councillor has interpreted this as saying it, the report, included a strong view amongst those interviewed that community boards added a layer of confusion and complexity, which was seen as a barrier rather than assisting engagement. This is a misrepresentation, and I wonder how many other councillors hold that view based on the briefings in the report. The view was not strong, it was held by some people or by a part of a small minority. It's concerning that council might describe finding a strong view to the Local Government Commission. Here's another point. 
The premise that a larger area means a better pool of quality candidates is not backed up by any evidence. And at the briefing given to you on 29th of June, you were told community voice showed that people liked the theory of community boards, but little evidence they actually worked. Our viewers wonder what evidence was sought. We add the following points ourselves. The design principles table near the end of the report um, has a statement about diversity. Majority perception, this is not achieved through another layer of elected representatives. Minority perception, this could be achieved by strengthening the role of community boards. How could the majority perception be anything at all about community boards when the majority didn't know they existed? Is this a reflection of the small minority of participants who knew what a community board was? And weren't there two views on that? We also note the report says many of the barriers that prevent some people from- the speaking time has expired. Can you, can almost you, finished. Can yeah. I carry on? Um, okay, I'll, skip, I'll skip through and wind up. So we note in the design brief that the prevailing perception of how um, it's achieved, diversity achieved, is summarised in a table. Of the nine design principles, community boards are mentioned twice as if they don't or can't reflect distinctive geographic communities of interest, help ensure high calibre representatives, ensure they can get across to people and issues, ensure minority voices are heard, not overshadowed, and give more focus to in need suburbs. Thank and you. Equality. Thank you very much. Um, questions? Can you press the button to raise your hand if you have a question? Councillors? Can I ask three questions? Hold on. Uh, Jocelyn Pravanov. Hold on, just, just when we can't hear you yet. Thank you very much for your presentation today and for taking the time to get some people who have got a background in this area to make comment on the, the survey results. Um, given the short time frame that we have got to get this process done in, do you any have any suggestions about how we can, um, I suppose, want it to be the way, um, provide information that is more encapsulating of what the um, population says? I think in your consultation, you could actually raise some of the issues that we've mentioned and any others that um, research reviewers might have raised. I only have covered a few of those, but I think that um, the community needs to understand that um, the basis on which council have made this decision is flawed. Right. Um, yeah, no, it's fine. Next, okay, yep. next, next question from Sophie Hanford. Sophie, uh, Sophie Hanford. Kia ora Tina and kia ora to the Whakakariki Community Board members on here this morning. My question is just around, so after having said all of that, Tina, and after having sought the views of um, people that we know are very experienced in this area and in our Whakakariki community, what would success look like um, for you at today's meeting um, on the recommendation that you're speaking, you're speaking to today? What would success look like, do you think, through your eyes? I think for me, it's a bit late in the piece, isn't it, to change your mind on this. So I think success would be an acknowledgement of the points we've made and, um, and uh, a better, um, a better um, scrutiny next time, particularly with such an important um, question around democratic representation, but also uh, consider success um, a consideration of why community boards were excluded from this decision-making process when they could have provided that scrutiny and would have expected to provide that scrutiny. Right. Um, next, Councillor Elliot. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, lovely. Look, thank you. Um, kia ora, Tina. Thank you so much for your korero. I wanted to ask your opinion on whether or not holding a limited time four week consultation period during a level four lockdown would have any effect, do you think, on the outcome as far as participation goes? Well, I think that's quite clear. Yes, I agree that it would. I'm not sure that um, uh, what you can do about that, but of course, people are going to be excluded from consultation. Um, because they're having to use devices and, um, and the message may not get out. Yeah, I think it's going to have a real impact. Thanks, Tina. Thank you. Right. Um, Councillors, those who have already asked the questions, can you lower your symbol? The Worship, we've got um, Community Board Member James Westbury wanting to ask a question. Mr Westbury. Jocelyn, can you take your thing off? Oh, hello there. Thank you for the uh, well put together um, query with regards to the statistical analysis. Uh, do you feel that part of the, um, what would you call it, pre-exposure drafts that were provided to community boards and also to council really provided um, us with a genuine opportunity to participate um, because of the first uh, exposure discussion we had as community boards, um, all the board members um, particularly outlined that they were significantly concerned about community boards being removed from any um, elected member structure. Um, sorry, I've just got to remember what the question was at the start. Um, I. Was it that? Um, do you, do you sorry, feel that the, community boards actually had an opportunity to? No, um, I don't feel that they had an opportunity to do that. Because the feedback that we provided during the um, sort of workshop um, evenings was really clear that we were significantly concerned about it. And it just appears to be, um, what would you describe it? Omitted from the inclusion into these papers and recommendations, which is a concern. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor McCann. Kia ora, um, Tina. Thank you very much for that presentation. That was excellent. As we move, once this meeting is over, if we move into that consultation process, do you think there is an opportunity for people uh, to put forward why community boards um, should be kept and that might rise uh, to the top in that process and allow us to um, receive information that you think is valid? Yes, that would make an opportunity. I agree there'd be an opportunity uh, for that to happen. I'd add that um, I question whether um, councillors, um, um, in fact, were concerned about underperforming and under-supported community boards rather than the model itself. Um, so I question, is it a failure of community boards? And is that why this is going out? Um, is it a restructure instead of a genuine attempt to improve the performance of community boards? Um, for example, by applying all of that targeted support that the proposal suggests would be um, supporting ward councillors. So you're aware that the process doesn't allow us to look at existing structures and say what will work best. It actually makes us look at the process as a whole. So we're somewhat limited to what we can actually do in this process. You're aware of that, aren't you? Yes, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor James Good. Morena, Tina, um, thanks Morena. so much for um, what you've raised with us today. It's um, certainly helpful in helping us consider this matter. You made a comment just uh, just earlier around um, unperforming, and the bit that I want to touch on more is around, I can't quite call whether you said unsupported or not supported or a word to that effect. Could you elaborate further on sure. how the, the so boards have been supported? If, in fact, this is an issue about underperforming community boards, why I, are not, why could, are not sorry, Tina, could I just clarify? I'm not referring to the unperforming because from my perspective, 
this isn't about people, it's about the process. I'm interested in the support aspect uh, and the comment you made about them being not supported. Okay, so I guess my, I'd, I'd return with a question of why did that list of uh, um, support options in the report that would be applied to ensure better diversity and connection with communities not applied to community boards? Is this in fact a failure of communication and civic education by council? Um, how... You know, how have community boards, how have any issues been raised with community boards and um, support wrapped around them in order to deal with any underperformance um, issues? Thanks, Tina. Thanks. Right. Uh, doesn't seem to be any other questions. Um, thank you, Tina, for an, an interesting submission. Um, can I have uh, the next speaker, Richard Mansell? Right, technology. Uh, good morning, Your morning. Worship and, and councillors. Um, I feel like I'm here to show some support for Waikanae. Um, and I understand that really you've backed yourself into a corner given the timelines and whatever I say will be ignored. But I am thankful that there is a process where we can go for full consultation, and then we can eliminate the council out of it and actually go to someone who can make decent decisions. Um, that is probably a little provocative, but let's go. Uh, I'm talking, I'm not talking as a member of the Waikanae Community Board, although I am one. Uh, I'm talking as a resident of and rate power in Waikanae. And my biggest concern about this whole process is that Waikanae as an entity is going to disappear. And um, the whole gambit of local body uh, representation is that it re represents a community of interest. And the Waikanae community of interest will disappear into the central zone um, and that wasn't successful when the central Vikings ran. And I don't think it'll be particularly successful with the central Kapiti. Um, I Waikna is a distinct um, geographical area with a distinct residential uh, makeup. Um, we may be uh, male, pale and stale, but, uh, or female, pale and stale, but we are voters and we are ratepayers. And I am particularly concerned that uh, our voice will be no longer heard. Um, it seems to be that uh, Waikanae was underrepresented and has been for the last six years. And there was no way you could uh, avoid that again by maintaining the Waikanae ward. So in order to get rid of uh, underrepresentation, you just decided to abolish us. And this seems to be more of a, an administrative convenience rather than a, um, a, a me means of proper representation. Um, my other point is that uh, communities of interest um, usually come with a taxation uh, component and you know, without taxation um, or without representation, there should be no taxation. Wars have been fought over this and nations have been founded on this principle. So um, to lose our, our, our say in how our money is spent seems to be um, undemocratic. Uh, we're going to be merged with Paparamu, who have a population of 21,000. And well, speaking uh, time is up. Okay. Waikanae is only 15,000, which gives Palaparamu a, a distinct advantage in getting more representatives. representatives. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of Waikanae uh, and pleading with you not to lump us in with Palaparamu. Thank you. 
Councillor Compton. Um, thank you for that, Richard. Uh, I don't know which I enjoyed more, the reference to the uh, Central Vikings for MPC fans or the threat of uh, Wyke and I starting a Boston Tea Party. Um, so I guess the crux of your concern is that if, without a community board and without a guaranteed um, represent, uh, board councillor specifically for Wyke and I, essentially your worry is that there's what, about maybe um, 20 or 30,000 of 20,000 people sort of south of the river in that Paraparaumu block, your worry is that they'll essentially swamp out like and I, and even if you um, have those three councils in that big central ward, then if you lose the community board as well, there's a real risk that in 2022, after the election, like and I could have no voice, um, no specific book, geographical voice for it at the table. Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Holborough. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you for that, Korero, um, Richard. Um, I'm sure uh, Te Ati Awaki Whakarongatai would have something to say about your pale male and stale <laughs> description of Waikanae. I'm just interested, what are some of your, um, what do you think defines Waikanae? What, what defines it as a community of interest? What are some of the features of Waikanae that don't exist south of the river? Well, to start off, we, we get rated separately. Um, you take money at a different rate from us to provide different services. Uh, we've got a fairly clear boundary of the Waikanae River, although I think uh, Waikanae Down sneaks into us. Um, we uh, have the you know, Rekarangi, which is, um, has always, in my mind, been part of Waikanae. It's just our our agricultural area. We have uh, the sea at one end um, and then we sort of merge into Ōtaki um, somewhere either Pekpeka or Te Horo, depending on administrative um, details but I, I, I take it back to something quite simple. It's when you turn out of your gate do you head left or right to go to your closest supermarket or your school for your kids or and that that would be your community of interest that's where, where you would head um, that's that's how I view, view it where you do your, your your basic business not your your recreation because you might go to the Pataramu Beach um, Golf Club for that or or somewhere else um, but it's where you do your, your everyday basic things where you go for a walk in lockdown. So I had another question if that's if that's yep. okay. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I think I heard you say that um why can I has been un underrepresented or unrepresented? Did I hear that correctly? And if so, could you elaborate on that and why you think that in the light of that, there wouldn't be some need for a review of representation for Waikanae? Uh, well, it seems, oh, from what I understand, and there are people probably around the table, Jocelyn, who may know better, that Waikanae at the last representation review was going to be underrepresented. It was at above the plus or minus 10% of representation and local government New Zealand had to give its approval for that um, that figure to, to be maintained. And I understand at the moment, well, from the council paper, it's moved to 26% underrepresented. Um, so I think uh, your, your council paper points to that, to the underrepresentation. Um, so the, the second part of your question um, was, sorry, what, Janet? Or Council Holbrook? <laughs> um, my, but the second part of my question was why in the light of that is it not positive to be looking at a different way of why can I being represented well my point is that why can I will cease to be represented or it potentially could cease to be represented um, uh, we've got you know, district wide councillors at the moment who uh, and going back to my why can I community board I've seen one of them at the Waikanae Community Board meetings. 
uh, in the last in the time I've been there. Um, and if they were representing the district like they meant to, then at least you know one should have been at every meeting I've been to. Um, I just don't think. Well, I can eyes. We've, we've we feel like we've seen as a cash cow um, and reasonably compliant, and we'll pay the money and shut up. But um, you've got to throw us a few crumbs. Thank you. Right, Councillor Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Richard, for your presentation today. Um, so, just to clarify, in terms of the, um, you know, maybe your comment about misrepresentation. So, um, the Waikanae Ward in the last triennium has um, plus 25, 26 um, percent more people than the average of other areas. Plus, based on the, the structure of the councillors, five ward councillors and five district-wide councillors, the Waikanae ward only had one councillor, whereas all other areas, some Otaki, for example, had five, I think it was, um, four or five, and all the other areas had, had, had more, than, more, more than two. So, um, and th this leads into my first question of two questions. So um, given the structure that has been proposed of removing community boards and having now a structure of still five ward councillors and five at-large councillors, don't you also think that it's not only why can I that potentially could be in a situation of where they have um, either no representation or basically a very small minority of councillors around the table. If you look at how um, how the structure is actually now set up, uh, yeah, <laughs> potentially. I mean, if you look at it, if we mobilised, yeah, yes, for Swike and I, and got all our um, voters uh, who are largely fairly compliant, will jump on and do their voting because that's what elderly people do, um, if we got them all to vote for Waikano-based councillors only, we could take over the world. It would be fantastic. Then we see some changes. Yeah. So, <laughs> you've, so got a, I, you've got a second question. Yeah, so, so just in comment to that, another question uh, I, then, I, I, is, I, that demo is that uh, democracy? Seriously, no? councillor, I don't want a conversation between you two. You've got a quick first question, ask the second question now. So based on the information that community boards have provided in terms of all their activities, um, and those community boards have 16 people, if those community boards are removed, how can you see that 10 councillors, I'm not sure whether it's 10 councillors or whether it's more ward councillors, are going to do the role of those 16 people? I think it's almost impossible um, unless the councillors are prepared to basically take on a full-time job. Um, they get paid a pittance at the moment uh, for the work they do and and I can see that um, they'd probably almost have to double their time. It just with with the community board it just filters it out um, makes it easier. Now, we get paid a little bit and we provide a, a, um, a conduit for people to talk to council and we, we get representations and we pass those representations on through to council officers and um, elected council. So I think unless they're prepared to do more work uh, for no more pay, I understand, I don't think democracy is going to work in this way. Okay. Council Holiday. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much for coming in. And also thank you for representing uh, Waikanae's voice, um, because this has been a concern, a bit of mine as well, uh, especially with the um, combining of Paraparumi and Waikanae and how that's going to work. Look, we've, um, we're, as it's been described, we're going back to a blank piece of paper. But if moving forward, you know, we have an option of a community board versus an option uh, of, say, other mechanisms in the community. Uh, from your perspective, 
what do you think would be more effective in the current climate? Right, there we go. Um, current climate. I think uh, you know, technology's damned us. Um, I think the question was around what do I see was the best way for the communities to be represented. I think the status quo is barely adequate. Um, I wonder whether Waikanae needs extra an extra councillor. Um, uh, where you get that from, I don't know, uh, because that would then throw out the ratios of the plus or minus 10%. I wonder whether the district-wide councillors, um, I don't know, be given a portfolio of, of a ward, uh, whether well, cleverer people have thought about this and, and you guys have been thinking about it for six to eight months. Um, but it, it doesn't seem that, and I bring it back to Waikanae again, Waikanae is going to be able to be represented properly. Councillor McCann. Right, thank you, Richard, uh, very much for that presentation. Um, looking at the four options, one of those is a district-wide model um, where we're not... Um, looking at a specific place where councillors have come from, do you think that that model would work? Because it, it is one that is used in many councils throughout New Zealand. Uh, I think that um, just increases the tyranny of the majority. If you've got uh, 20,000 people voting in Paparamu, then they will likely or possibly vote for more people uh, from their own district. Um, I'd actually think that uh, wards, wards only and lots of smaller wards might be a better way of doing it, um, in which case, uh, you know, people could represent their communities of interest and people would have a person to go to um, because everybody uh, pledges an allegiance to the flag or whatever, undertakes an oath of office to work in the best interest of Kapiti, but you still have an overriding concern, you know, if that whatever's good for Waikanae should be good for the rest of the place, uh, rest of Kapiti. But um, I think you need to you need to be linked back to the people somehow, um, and by eliminating, you know, being linked. I mean, a district-wide councillor. It's like a list MP. I mean, they. They have no direct link, although some of the some of them are, are placed in communities and and operate almost as a, a ward uh, an, a, an electorate MP. They have no proper um, home, as it were, uh, and therefore no real allegiance. Um, and it's nothing like getting in front of the face of your of your elected representative and and, and telling them what you think. Uh, probably solves a whole lot of problems. You can vent your spleen and, and move on. Um, so I, I'd prefer, you know, more smaller wards rather than one one super, you know, district-wide council. Thanks, Richard. All right. Um, thank you, Richard. No other questions. Thank you for your submission. Uh, the next speaker is Margaret Stevenson-Wright, Waikana Community Board. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can, um, is my volume of voice sufficient at the moment? Yeah, everybody says good. Thank you. Um, I, I will lose eye contact from time to time because I'm one of the demographic um, that Richard speaks of, one of the elderly. So I am actually reading from some notes here as well. 
I speak in support of the retention of community boards as they currently exist. The representation review preferred option put forward is based on a set of principles formulated by external advice and engagement with 0.3 of 1% of Kapiti electors. Some principles are strong, others are weak. The geographic community distinction is strong with conformity to catchments and stats New Zealand mesh blocks being identified as such in Schedule 3 of the LGA 2002. The Waikanae community identifies strongly with the river, from the beach to the peak of Kapa Kapa Nui. A parallel applies to Otaki, from the beach to the Taro Ruas. Many of the other principles are weak with debatable perceptions and not forceful argument for the removal of community boards. A professional development workshop delivered by Steve McDowell in October 2019 spoke to the importance of community intelligence as a key tool for elected members in support of decision making. He described community intelligence as the ability of an elected member to understand their community's interests, needs, expectations, issues and contention and wishes and apply that knowledge to decision making processes. In Dr. Mike Reed's words, community boards are one of the ways in which council keeps in touch with the flax roots, a role that has increased in importance as local authorities have become larger and communities more diverse. Dr. Reed's view holds true within the context of capacity and council predicted growth. The roles of elected members of community board, councillors and appointed staff are not in competition, but are complementary. The members of all contribute to the decision-making of councillors and appointed staff and add strength to the decision-making process. Community intelligence can be achieved through organised consultation, or as I've found, it finds you. Personal examples that come to mind, attending a sponsorship evening at the bowling club, I learned of issues of concern to residents within the Charles Fleming complex. Next day, I went to visit the area and looked at some of the issues being raised, which um, one of which was a bridge uh, which bridged a drainage channel without handrails, which posed a risk to young children on bicycles through to the elderly who felt insecure when walking their dogs. Out of those concerns, a solution was readily put in place by council. Not all issues raised can be as readily resolved and neither are all issues raised through face-to-face -face consultation. Speaking Recent time is up. Can you, um, Margaret, can you wind this up quickly? Yes, um, very briefly. Um, recently, I've had contact, um, non-personal um, face-to-face contact, but through email with a family who bought a home in Waikanae. The catalyst for their purchase being that the neighbouring land was zoned private and recreational use. They have huge concerns now about a proposed development and fear that this may be rezoned completely. This, through email discussion, um, brought to me, and I've never met the person, but we've talked on email, is now in the very capable hands of VJ Soma. In, in, in conclusion, I think that the relationship between councillors, appointed staff and community board members is clearly important in the injection of community interest into efficiency and effectiveness objectives. In summary, I speak for the retention of community boards as they currently exist and urge all boards to take the advice of Mary Guru Nathan in terms of how localism can be further enhanced through the identification of further delegations that can be achieved. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, question time. Doesn't seem to be any. Uh, Councillor Pravano. Give you six minutes. Have we got Councillor Pravano? Yes, hello. Thank you, Mr Mayor. So just to, um, in terms of admin, is there a way for us to see if there's any other people who've got questions? Because I can't seem to find that that's more for DEM services. That's my first question. Um, and so, and, and thank you, Margaret, for um, 
for speaking today. So I just want to um, <clears throat> raise a question around the community um, intelligence that you mentioned. I'm just wondering if you have any comments on how you would think if um, those community board members are not there um, and that hopefully at least one councillor would be in an area to, to do all that um, community intelligence. Um, councillor, thank you for the question. Um, and it's an, a, an individual view that individual view that is coming in my response. I actually think an individual council would be hard pushed um, to accumulate that intelligence, but I believe that what exists at the moment works incredibly well. With community board members um, achieving that intelligence, sharing it um, with yourself as ward councillor and with others um, on the appointed staff of council. I, I think that what exists has strength. Thank you. Right, can I have uh, Councillor Elliot, then Councillor Compton, then Count, uh, then Holly Ewan? Hi, good morning, Margaret. Thank you so much for your call at all. I wanted to ask you the same question I asked Tina Pope from Pakakariki Community Board, and that is, do you think that holding a four-week consultation process in a level four lockdown will be will have any effect on the robustness of the responses from the community? Um, Councillor, thank you for your question. I believe that any consultation can only strengthen a process. So, yes. Thank you. Um, Councillor Compton? Um, thank you for that, Margaret. Uh, you've got a fair bit of experience in this space. So, as you know, that as councillors, we quite often, um, you know, we've got to keep an open mind and we've got to wait and hear out all the views. And we've, I guess we've got to be careful about how we engage on decisions that are coming to council. Do you think that that's a space where community boards add a lot of value in terms of that they're not necessarily constrained like that around the decisions that council are making so that they're able to go out in the community and actually encourage and um, engage with people on, a, I guess, a much freer basis than councillors are able to? I think that... Um I think that, yes, community boards can do just that, Glenn. Um, but I think that in saying that, that our roles are complementary in that what community boards can garner in terms of community intelligence can then be very satisfactorily acted upon by councillors such as yourself um, at, at the table with voting rights and also by appointed staff in specialisations across um, the across Kapiti District Council. Um, and I've found, um, as I alluded to earlier, that when I've brought examples either to councillors themselves or in tandem to councillors and to the relevant appointed staff, um, then solutions occur for the benefit of everybody, frankly. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Holly Ewans, Chair of the Pakakiriki Community Board. Kia ora. Thank you, Margaret. I've just got a question for you. Um, I'd just like to know, in your experience of dealing with um, large external agencies, not KCDC itself, but the likes of NZTA, um, Wakatahi, and other Greater Wellington Regional Council, um, do you think that if under the new proposal that um, a community group would be walking alongside a ward councillor, do you think that community group would be able to get the same sort of traction that, um, that the community board currently does. I know in Paikakariki, we've had some good traction and we've had to press really hard to, um, to have engagement with NZTA. And um, we were privy to information even before councillors. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your question, Holly. In response, no, I don't believe a community group would necessarily be able to achieve an equal traction or an equal degree of traction. Um, like you, I say, um, I, well, I speak from the background of have been, having been in central government agencies, inclusive of NZTA for 10, over 10 years. Um, but I think that, no, I think that would, that traction would be hard gained, actually. And I believe that the experience uh, within the existing structure of community boards is much more likely to achieve that. Thank you. Councillor Hanford. 
Morena Margaret, thanks for your corridor this morning. So I'm interested in kind of teasing out the comment you made that you think community boards work extremely well, and I definitely don't disagree with that. I'm just wondering if you think that there's, um, though, any way at all that we can strengthen the current model or function of community boards, or do you, do you think that they're absolutely perfect and that there's nothing that can be improved in that space? Thank you for that wonderful question, Councillor. Um, I believe there's always something that can be improved in any space. And I think that if I go back to the comment that I made before, I would urge community boards, all community boards, um, to take on board what um, Mayor Guru Nathan had said about how localism can be further enhanced. And that is a discussion that community boards need to have among themselves that could involve some development of on a number of fronts, but really so that um, localism could be enhanced through future and further delegations given to community boards. But in saying that community boards themselves have to take and make that effort. Right, I think we've got James Westbury, am I right? Hi, Margaret, I've got two questions to ask you. Um, do you think the Waikanae community would um, recognise itself as a community in, of interest against Pauparumu? Um, I think that the Waikanae community would recognise, certainly recognise its Self as a community of interest, um, but I would not put it in, I would not phrase it in a competitive way as versus, I would say along with. I think the no. Waikanae community would very readily agree that Faraparam, Faraparamu is a community of interest um, and that as is Waikanae, but not in a competitive sense. Thank you. And one other thing. Do you think there would be sufficient support within our community uh, to appeal any decision that's made today um, through the, the commission? Yes, I do. I do, James, actually. I believe that there would be support, but there would need to be, obviously, um, it's a tight time frame for consultation. And consultation was mentioned earlier by Councillor Compton and others. So I think that, yes, there would be support. Do you think it's going to be an expensive um, uh, waste of time going through this process then for councillors to be a, find that they find themselves in a situation where this is appealed? I think it's a process that has to now has to occur, um, but I think the expense, and um, I think we've had this conversation before at the council table, cost and expense wears many faces. And I think that that needs to be taken into account too when we're looking at this. Um, there are a lot of different ways that costs can impact. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. That's the end of questions for you. Thank you very much for that interesting submission. Uh, can I ask Councillor Prabhano to read the letter from um, Graham Trust? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this letter was received from Mr. Trask yesterday <clears throat> to, to Mayor and Councillors, re-abolishing community boards. I'm writing to voice my concern of the matter. Community boards are the first port of call for many ratepayers in our communities. They have been around for many years, 1998, 1989, I believe, and have a proven uh, and have proven to be an excellent platform where ratepayers can discuss their concerns ideas and informal meetings in a more relaxed atmosphere. It can be more daunting for some to publicly express their thoughts in a formal meeting as opposed to a community board meeting. We have been mindful yeah. that council is seen to be giving all ratepayers rate payer fair ways around representation in, at the table through informing and debating before having outcomes. This can only be achieved by retaining community boards and retaining the present structure. Just let me scroll up here. Community boards are the grassroots of our communities. They provide a framework for the communication between councils and the communities and can be seen to be mutually beneficial. A small matter at a regional level can be of, a, of great interest at a local level. 
by not having input or representation from community board matters could easily be overlooked or be insignificant. Another example could be when a community board could bridge a gap in those communications. Community board members have more time to linger in their communities discussing, debating, and getting some sort of consensus on local issues. They have better access to council staff than the general public, helping promoting collaboration along with transparency between council and the community. Lastly, our region continues to grow at a rampant pace. Good representation can only be achieved by growing our community boards, not abolishing them. I hope, my hope is for all council elected members to take on board the seriousness of this matter and vote to retain our community boards in their current form. Let, let's keep democracy alive. Your regards, Graham Trask. Right. Um, thank you very much. That brings the uh, item number five, public speaking time items on the agenda to an end. Item number six, members business, uh, 6A, public speaking time response that will be covered in item 8.1. Um, six B, leave of absence. Any leave of absence? Um, nobody wants a holiday or oh, sorry, we are on lockdown. Nope, um, matters of an urgent nature. I've not been notified of any. Mayor's um, report, you've had a copy of that. Can I have a mover and a seconder to, can I have a mover? Councillor Hanford moved, seconded Councillor Elliott. All those in favor say aye. Yep, carried. We now come to item number eight, but do we need a few minutes break? Okay. We'll take a five minute break, which means we'll come back, what time? 10.30. We're back in 10.30. Cool. <laughs> 